This is your brain on risk. This is Mind Over Money, the podcast where Kevin Cook exposes the psychology of investing. Welcome back to Mind Over Money. I'm Kevin Cook, your field guide and storyteller for the fascinating arena of behavioral economics. My last podcast, which I think was back in June... Um, yeah, I don't do them that often, but uh, you know, I try and come up with some good topics. In June, I did a podcast called The ET Economy, Disruptive Tech and the Behavior of Shopping, or Why Facebook, Alibaba, and Amazon, and Shopify are Stocks You Should Own. Um, and so you know, people who follow me as investors or otherwise know that I'm crazy about Facebook and Alibaba. I own both of their stocks, uh, as well as Google and Amazon. Um, I, a year ago in June, I said you have to buy Google and Amazon when they're trading under seven hundred and fifty dollars if you wanted to be a part of the future of technology, uh, whether it was with automation or some of the new technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today, uh, because I've been very curious what Facebook is up to. Now, I think Facebook is one of the most exciting business successes of this decade. Uh, I'm sure we can talk about the the whole economy coming out of the financial crisis, which was uh, unprecedented and and hard to believe how we came out of that. Uh, and we can talk about all kinds of technology, hardware, and software. But it seems like the hardware and software is um, predictable in the sense that you know whatever you could imagine in your wildest dreams in terms of science fiction, you know somebody is working on. What I was the reason I think Facebook is the uh, the most interesting success is because it was so surprising to see this social network uh, be able to come out of nowhere w- with an advertising platform that is growing revenues leaps over bounds. Uh, last year, they did almost $27 billion in ad revenue, um, and it's 98% of their business. And this year, they're going to top that uh, with uh, almost 40% growth, almost $39 billion in ad revenue. So so the what we didn't talk about last time in that podcast, which and so this kind of makes this a part two, is what is Facebook up to by hiring uh, an advanced engineer from the government? And I'm speaking, of course, about Regina Dugan, uh, who was the lead scientist for DARPA. That's the uh, the Pentagon's uh, defense uh, and advanced research projects wing. Now before. Regina Dugan went to work for Facebook. She was at Google uh, in their, you know, secret experimental labs. Uh, Google has several that we know the names of, like Google X, and then ATAP, which is uh, Advanced Technology and Projects. Uh, and that's what uh, Dugan did for for Google, working on some stuff there. You know, probably combinations of hardware and software, the cutting edge, so to speak. Well, then. Facebook poaches her, and uh, she works for them now in what they call Building 8. That's their secret experimental lab. So I want to know what's going on there, and uh, I've been trying to get some people on my podcast to come on and tell me. Um, I haven't found anybody yet, so if you're interested, come on, let's, let's talk about it if, you're, if you have some expertise in these areas. So we know that Facebook bought Oculus Rift, um, and it's a you know it's virtual reality, uh, gaming thing. Uh, it hasn't been a huge success for them. It's definitely a, you know, a very tiny part of their business model. But I figure they have to be up to something else with advanced technology and uh, Regina Dugan. Uh, because, but it's got to be tied in to their core revenue source, which is advertising sales. Um, so what would that be? I mean, beyond gaming, it could be um, augmented reality shopping experiences, Augmented reality education experiences. That's what I'm thinking. So that's, uh, uh, you know, in searching for some kind of expert on this, I came across uh, somebody that that I'd like to have on. Uh, his name is Tim Merrill. He is the uh, managing director of a firm called Digi Capital, uh, research firm Digi, Digi Capital, D-I-G-I-Capital.com. And you can find him on uh, Twitter um, at DigiCapital. He advises uh, AR and VR firms and mobile and game leaders around the globe. Uh, And he has written some excellent articles that uh, he posts on TechCrunch, which uh, explain things, you know, 
in e- easy to understand way, and he and he he's sort of diagramming the whole uh, the whole jungle of this technology and looking at it from a business perspective too. Like, who are the leaders now? Who could be the winners down the road? So, I will be back faster than you can tell me what DARPA means, and uh, we'll get rolling with the insight from Digi Capital. All right, so I'm going to bring you some insight from Tim Merrill of Digi Digi Capitalist, and uh, you know, I'm going to be using the recent articles that he wrote on TechCrunch. He wrote a piece in January of this year, which had a lot of insight and predictions in it. I want to go back to that because you know they're worth reviewing. He repeats them because he was spot on about several things in terms of uh, these industries. And uh, the, the name of this article on TechCrunch is The Reality of VR AR Growth. And let me uh, read a couple paragraphs from him here. VR will be big. AR will be bigger and take longer. What sounded revolutionary when we first said it two years ago has become accepted wisdom. But now the market has actually launched and we've got 12 months of real world performance and major tech player strategies emerging. And that's changed our views on VR, AR growth a lot. Our new base case is that mobile AR could become the primary driver of a 108 billion VR, AR market by the year 2021. And he's got a range around that of 94 billion to 122 billion. Uh, But he notes that AR will be the lion's share of that at 83 billion and VR only comprising 25 billion. And so if you're not familiar with the technologies, and, and I'm no expert here, um, but I will uh, try and describe. So, you know, think of VR like, so Facebook owns this company, Oculus Rift, and you put this big headset on and you can have all kinds of, uh, you know, experiences based on what the software is doing and, and, uh, and the potential for gaming. Uh, but, you know, most people don't want to wear a clunky headset around and you're not, you don't see them anybody on the bus or walking down the street with one on, uh, you know, those are isolated experiences that are technology heavy in, in the sense of the equipment they require. Um, and then AR would be something more like uh, Google, Google Glasses, you know, any kind of um, uh, technology that it may start with the software in your phone being connected to some other device and creating augmented experiences for you you know, whatever you're seeing or doing. All right. So that's the, that's the basic thing there. And you know what? I mean, I look at this stuff like I'm not a gamer. I'm not putting on a virtual reality headset for any reason, anytime soon. (laughs) Uh, And I probably won't do anything with AR in the next three months. Um, You know, I'll get dragged into it somehow. But what I know studying technology trends is that the early adopters, whether that's, uh, you know, 12 year olds or college kids that uh, new technology grabs them, um, you know, and it's just an addictive force, and it, then it becomes part of their life. And you know, companies like Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, any hardware or software maker has figured this out. So that's why it's important to talk about it. Um, you know, f- uh, Facebook's Oculus Rift um, hasn't done much uh, in terms of sales, and and who knows what it will become. Uh, uh, Merrill likes to talk about the success of Pokemon Go as a sort of a game changer in terms of it showing the rest of the market, hey, here's what's, what's possible with an AR software platform because of, of how addictive and viral it became with you know um, hundreds of millions of people downloading it and and they created uh, you know I think I believe they created like 600 million in mobile AR revenue in the first three months alone. So, Merrill goes over a lot of the the competitors in this jungle. He talks about um, who had Daydream, Daydream View. I believe that was that. Well, uh, Sony launched PlayStation VR, and the quiet achiever last year was Google. Oh, Google launched Daydream View mobile VR headset controller, and they launched the first Tango mobile AR phone. Um, and what helped the market a lot too was that Snap launched their spectacles which made, he says, which made wearing goofy future glasses cool again, <laughs> even though it really, really isn't AR. 
So the market in 2016 did like uh, 3.9 billion. Um, so you you can see this ramp that he expects coming, and he he knows the market. So I, I think that his est it looks like his estimates for 2016 were right on, and he's very excited about his estimates for the next four or five years here, where this becomes um, you know a hundred billion dollar market, and it was only four billion last year. So. Uh, Oh, some other notes here in this article he has that I want to point out. So he talks about Sony and Microsoft and and their VR efforts as, you know, not really getting a ton of traction. So so here's the thing that I want to point out about Pokemon Go is that apparently Tim Cook loved it. I didn't know this. Cook said that uh, Apple is very high on AR in the long run, and they would continue to invest a lot in this. AR can be huge. And that's quoting Tim Cook. Um, Google's uh, Sundar Pichai and f- obviously Facebook Zuckerberg and Microsoft's uh, Satya Nadella also hailed Pokemon Go as a major early win for AR. Now, uh, we talked about experimental labs. Well, we know for sure Apple has one. Um, wouldn't you love a tour of this new facility they just built, this this incredible spaceship-looking thing that's, uh, I mean, can you imagine what's going on in there? So the next thing I want to talk about is that uh, Merrill points out the five big challenges. AR. Oh, I know I wanted to mention Apple is uh, reporting earnings about an hour from now. As, as I record this, Apple's reporting earnings, and uh, the stock has been held back. I'm bullish, but the stock has been held back because the market thinks that they're going to be late with the iPhone 8. Um, you know, this is going to be the new fancy OLED screen, and you know, I don't know if it's going to cost a thousand bucks or what, but that they'll be late on delivery, and so you know, any expectations about what you know what the next quarter is going to look like, you know, that those sales that revenue gets pushed out, but I mean, long term, Apple's a buy, so um, and and we're going to get into that and why, <laughs> and, and Merrill's going to help us. So the five big challenges for AR that they need to con- that any software or technology provider needs to conquer, according to Merrill, is one, uh, it needs to be a hero device. And by that, he means like an Apple quality device. Two, all day battery life. You know, if it's if it's going to be something you're going to wear around, it's got to be just like your phone, right? So, so the, the glasses concept, you know, they obviously have a battery challenge there. Uh, mobile connectivity, clearly. Uh, part of an app ecosystem, obviously. We, you know, we've seen where, where it works for Apple. And then lastly, telco cross subsidization. I assume that means, you know, AT&T helps you buy your phone, right? As they help me buy my iPhones. <laughs> and I still end up paying a ton for them. All right. So those are good things to point out. Um, you know, so when you're looking at, looking at things like the battery problem or connectivity, you know, Merrill says these are not, you know, these are not small problems, um, and it's a major developer. It's a major risk for any developer of this ecosystem. They've got to invest heavily in building apps for new platforms until the installed base reaches scale. In other words, if you don't, you know, if people aren't adopting uh, adopting it, then you, you know you can't invest heavily in it. He says it's the perennial chicken and egg problem that all new tech platforms face. Uh, he has some great quotes here from Zuckerberg when he talks about uh, augmented reality. Zook says, The phone is probably going to be the mainstream consumer platform where a lot of these AR features become mainstream rather than a glasses form factor that people will wear on their face. Yeah, I'm, I mean, th- that makes a lot of sense because people are already, uh, their phones are already a huge part of their lives and it's easy to start with the AR software there than expecting people to wear goofy glasses around at the office. (laughs) Uh, So he says, uh, uh, Merrill says, smartphones solve four of the major challenges for mass consumer AR already. All-day battery life, mobile connectivity, an app ecosystem, and telco subsidization. Uh, (laughs) All right, so uh, you got to look up this article on TechCrunch, again, from uh, January of 2017, title was The Reality of VR AR Growth by Tim Merrill, um, because he's got some cool graphics in here too. Um, and, and this is where we really get into the business aspect. If you're looking at any of this as an investor, he's got a great graphic uh, about um, replacement cycles. You know, how often are people replacing their phones? 
And I mean, I can't even describe the graphic, but it just it just gives you a good idea of uh, of what happens in these product cycles. And he says most developed mobile markets have have hit saturation, with sales coming from consumers replacing their phones regularly, despite not really needing to. And we know that's true. How long does that go on? You know, it's like I, I've been thinking when. You know, who could could you have imagined a seven hundred dollar phone almost becoming disposable? And I see people do it all the time. You know, oh, I need a new phone, and it's like, oh my god, you're holding this computer in your hand that does that does you know space age stuff that it used to take a room full of computers to do twenty years ago, and now it's almost disposable. It's crazy. Um, he says it's just something that we do, but that replacement cycle has been edging up from under two years toward three years, you know, people hanging on to their phones longer. Hey, if you, if you can not lose it and not break it, you know, why not? I'm, I'm still on like an iPhone success, I think. And I got three people in my family that have sevens and I'm, I'm going to beat them silly if they think about going to an eight. Um, but so, but Meryl's pointing out, this is a major headache for Apple and Samsung. If, you know, they've, if their revenue ramp has been based on these tight replacement cycles, and that's going to be harder and harder to do as the phones become more advanced and more expensive. Um, then things level off, growth levels off, and that's what you've seen um, with Apple apparently. So uh, I'm going to move on to Merrill's most recent article from July 18th, just a few weeks ago, where he really gets into something about AR. And the article is titled "The Four Waves of Augmented Reality," and then and then in parentheses it says that Apple owns. Okay, so this is interesting now. So he's he's studied this. You know, the first article was from uh, from January, and nine months later, uh, probably uh, after the developers' conference that Apple had, um, you know, he's got new ideas about how Apple is just going to own the space. And so let me explain to you what he means uh, by by there being four waves within AR. And I'll read from his, from his article here. We've been saying for the last couple of years that augmented virtual reality is the fourth wave of consumer technology and that AR could become much bigger than VR. But AR itself is not one giant wave. It's a set of four big ones. Mobile AR software, mobile AR hardware, tethered smart glasses, and standalone smart glasses. These four waves could drive augmented reality from tens of millions of users and 1.2 billion in revenue last year to more than a billion users and 83 billion. And that was, uh, that was his projection, remember, in January that he's project- projecting that the AR market can grow to 83 billion and, um, and be you know three to four times larger than virtual reality. So you got to find this article, July 18th, uh, The Four Waves of Augmented Reality on TechCrunch because he's got an excellent graphic in here where he labels the four waves, mobile AR software, mobile AR hardware, tethered smart glasses, and standalone smart glasses, and then um, plots all the players in, in uh, in the jungle, so to speak, all the competitive players. And what stands out is that Apple is a, is a central player in all four of those waves, uh, whereas Google and Facebook, you know, Google might be in three of them. Well, actually, I think Google's in all four of them too, but maybe to a lesser extent. Facebook shows up in a couple of places. Uh, Tencent is in there, um, another uh, monster Chinese um, web ecosystem platform. And uh, you see Samsung in there, you know, competing obviously heavily with Apple through most of most of these uh, these four waves. And so let me just uh, explain why he what he's talking about with these four waves that evolve. You know, Facebook is is early with AR software with their camera effects platform. So and obviously where Facebook wins if they can get something out to market quickly is their user base. You know, they just crossed the two billion mark for monthly active users on Facebook, but but the other platforms and there's a lot of crossover have you know, billions of users too, from uh, Messenger and WhatsApp and then Instagram. Um, and here's what Facebook is good at, is getting people to, you know, move, say, off of the desktop and start using 
um, the mo- these different mobile apps that are you know integrated platforms. Uh, Merrill notes Facebook migrated 15% of WhatsApp users to status 10 to status 10 weeks after launch. 29% of Instagram users to stories less than a year after launch, and 54% of Instagram users to direct four years after launch. A similar growth curve could deliver around 400 million installed base for Facebook's camera effects platform by the end of 2018. So, uh, you know, Facebook is having a lot of success there, but what Merrill sees is that um, F- Facebook is going to struggle with the hardware aspect, whereas Apple won't, and that's where Apple will leave them behind. So you really definitely want to take a look at this article from July because he he goes through all um, the waves, these four waves, and then looks at all the different players and what they're doing, you know, including Google and Samsung uh, and even Tencent. And I think Alibaba's in here somewhere too. Um, but his conclusion is that Apple owns your augmented future. So Facebook, as we talked about, their user base and their platforms, Messenger, Instagram, WhatsApp, and their developer ecosystem, mobile AR developer tools, mobile market experience, and financial muscle guarantee its success in mobile AR software. However, Facebook's entry into the phone hardware market did not go to plan and Oculus is orders of magnitude smaller than the rest of Facebook. This makes a mobile AR hardware play, in essence a Facebook AR phone, look unlikely. And that's, uh, that's Merrill talking uh, in this article. He also notes Mark Zuckerberg believes in smart glasses' long-term future, but a head-to-head battle with Apple in this market might not be a fair fight. So... You know, he he sees Facebook, you know, possibly they could launch some smart glasses at some point, but they'll probably stick to their knitting as an AR software company. Either way, he expects significant Facebook investment in AR beyond the camera effects platform. And I do too. And I want to know, you know, how are they going to use this to create, uh, you know, alternative or augmented shopping experiences and and possibly education? Because... Again, Facebook is, you know, 98% of their revenue comes from advertising. So they need to be able to tie in the technology to the way people are using the web, and I assume in augmented ways, mobily, um, that drives new advertising revenue. You know, they, uh, and I'll give you an example of a simple product that's simple to understand. Uh, they rolled out something on Messenger. Uh, with bots. So now a marketer who can communicate with his, you know, his contacts, his friends, whatever on Facebook can message them with offers or information. Um, And so that's an innovation that uh, is working well for many advertisers. Um, And I don't know if advertisers have to pay right now to use bots, but at some point, these types of, of technological and software innovations that allow a marketer to have better access to their customers or prospects um, is key for Facebook to continue to grow its revenues where it, you know which is its wheelhouse let me talk about Alibaba real quick because I own Alibaba you know uh, to me Facebook and Alibaba are like my uh, are like my Google and my Amazon right Facebook and Google you know dominant digital advertising players so um, you know, trying to buy Google here at a thousand dollars is tricky for some investors. So I say, you know, you buy Facebook, and uh, and you know we've owned it since below one hundred and twenty bucks. Um, and then Alibaba is the Amazon of China, and just doing many of the same things, and it will be the gateway to China. Um, as I said in my last podcast, it was great when Jack Ma did his U.S. tour. He came here. And was asked, you know, what's your agenda? You know, are you trying to get American consumers to buy Chinese goods? Uh, and he said, no, quite the opposite. I want to invite the U.S. small business and medium-sized business to come and use Alibaba as the gateway to the largest middle class in the world. You know, you're talking nearly 600 people, so 600 million people. So Alibaba is is doing many of the same things that Amazon is, and some of these other firms are. Uh, they're not developing hardware like uh, Apple or 
or Facebook, at least not to my knowledge. But Alibaba has many different businesses. You know, they have uh, financial businesses, media businesses within um, the main platform. So here's what uh, Merrill says about uh, Alibaba. Alibaba has already invested heavily in AR with a view to becoming the AR e-commerce leader in China, where it doesn't have Tencent's advantages as a mobile AR software platform. So Tencent is already doing things in mobile AR software, um, you know, where they're ahead of Alibaba uh, and probably something to do with gaming too. Uh, here is, uh, is Tim Merrill again. Given Jack Ma's penchant for bold moves in new markets, he might consider going from Magic Leap's lead investor to its owner. Uh, I'm not that familiar with Magic Leap. Uh, so, um, you know, but that's the thing is, is Alibaba is like an Amazon or a Google where they're, where they're in doing a lot of venture capital stuff. They're investing in small companies, buying pieces of them, things that they see, hey, this is going to be, this company has potential, this technology and uh, and they go out and and become a part of it. All right, um, that's enough of the good news from uh, from Tim Merrill, who's you know really uh, gone in and sort of done a an archaeological dig or a or a biological uh, expose of the ecosystem here um, for all these companies trying to compete with uh, AR and VR. So, and my goal is, you know, if, if you're an investor in any of these companies, you know, you invest to win. And, and that's why I continue to own Facebook and Alibaba. Um, and you look at the companies that are going to be successful creating ecosystems or ecospheres, maybe they call them now. Uh, Apple, you know, hey, listen, if, if this, uh, by, the time you, by the time you listen to this, you'll know if they gave Wall Street a report they loved or not uh, with the upcoming launch of the iPhone 8. But but think longer term. Think about what Apple is doing with technology and software and how they're already embedded in people's lives with their, with their ecosphere. So this is why you own Apple for the long term. So if the stock drops below 140, you want to buy it for the long term. All right. That's, uh, that's my attempt to look at the investing opportunities in AR and VR. And uh, thanks for joining me. We'll uh, probably have a part three on this when I get somebody on here to figure out what Facebook is up to with their uh, with the DARPA scientist Regina Dugan. All right, we'll talk to you soon.